Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel, and thanks for logging on. If you enjoy these videos, do me a favor and subscribe to our YouTube channel here at Watchbox Reviews. I update daily, and I'd really appreciate the gesture. If you like this watch, you can purchase it on thewatchbox.com. Buy, trade, and sell luxury watches on thewatchbox.com. Today we are discussing one of the truly great post-Quartz Crisis Omegas. That is to say, from the mid-80s, when what was then known as SMH, the predecessor of the Swatch Group, had been established from the ruins of the SIHH and the ASWAG, this timepiece is one of the best watches made since then to the present. I once said this is less a Bond Omega than a Bond Villains Omega, and I'm standing by that. I think it would look fine on the wrist of Largo, the villain from Thunderball, but you can decide for yourself. What I can say is that this is a watch for me. It's part of the Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter family. This is actually the Seamaster Professional Chrono Diver 300 meter in three metals, titanium, tantalum, and rose gold. Yes, all three. A sensational piece that debuted as the flagship, not just of the Seamaster line, but of the entire company, with the sole exception of the Torbion. Back in 1993, this thing didn't just rule the waves, this thing ruled the catalog as Omega's flagship model. A timepiece that's actually fairly wearable at 41 millimeters across the round of the case. You can style even if you don't have a huge wrist, as I'd say this watch could be worn on a wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference. That said, it is thicker than the standard so-called Bond Seamaster, as it's 16.5 millimeters thick. Lug to lug, it's fairly manageable at 48.5 millimeters, but if you add the solid end links to the bracelet, it does have a broader stance across the wrist of 54.5. That said, 20 millimeters is the lug spacing should you wish to put this watch on a strap, but considering the tri-tone, tri-metallic bracelet built for the watch, putting this thing on a strap would be an act of true villainy in the strictest sense. Uh, the I don't even think Blofeld would be in favor of that. That would be a crime against humanity, because this thing is gorgeous. Now, the timepiece on my wrist is, I would say, reminiscent of steel. The combination of the tantalum and the rose gold more or less cancels the lightning effect of the titanium. What I can't dispute is that the case back in titanium, as well as the interior of the bracelet, all hypoallergenic materials. So if you've got a nickel allergy and some alloys of steel, create problems for you, this is the watch you want for wholly practical purposes. Now getting close to the watch, you can see, let's get the watch in focus, there's a lot going on. The bracelet features three separate tones and three separate metals. First of all, most of it is titanium, so the darker gray, or I would say the dominant gray, is titanium. The gray in between the rose gold center link profiles is actually the tantalum. The tantalum is a sort of purple blue gray that's more distinctly slate gray, whereas the titanium is more of a metallic and the rose gold has gorgeous red tones that pop against the metal base of the two gray metals. Absolutely sensational to look at. It feels just as good as the bracelet, although it uses the earlier pin sleeve sizing system rather than the newer Screws features the same profile underneath with big gaps to avoid pinching skin, pulling hair, or trapping heat on the wrist on a hot day. The clasp is nicely made, machined from the solid. This was the best dive clasp of the 1990s, and it remains competitive. Trigger release, so no cheap clamshell system or friction fit, and it still features the pull-out extension, itself machined from solids that inspires confidence. Use it over a wetsuit, use it over a dry suit, or just do like me, and use it over a thick winter sweater or coat. Now moving back to the case, the case will be familiar for those who know the Omega Seamaster, and the Speedmaster families with sheer flanks, satin finished, and beveled tops. But you'll note that here the bevels are also in satin. While the Planet Ocean later went to a grade 5 titanium, this generation of Seamaster used a grade 2 that was always of a matte or satin finish. Let's get a little bit closer. And now you can see to good effect that the watch uses a tantalum bezel base. You can really see the contrast between the titanium of the case flank and, and the purple blue gray of the tantalum bezel itself. The bezel features a rose gold insert with blue lacquer. So you can see everything that appears to be a calibration or a numeral is actually a blue lacquer inlay and the contrast is very handsome. The helium escape valve is present and correct for you saturation divers. For everyone else, great talking piece. If you ever do a dive in which helium might accumulate inside the watch, 
you have that to avoid seal and crystal blowout. And you're probably going to talk about it more than you ever use it, but it's nice to have. Now the timepiece does feature a solid case back with the classic Seamaster Hippocampus. We'll talk about the 1164 caliber underneath in a moment, but first let's talk a little bit about the dial. The dial is sublime. There's the color that was intentional, and you can see the blue wave base in matte blue. You can see the rose gold hands. You can see the rose gold chapter rings for each of the sub-registers and the shocks of red. What is not intentional is the fade of the indices. This is a real, no joke, aged tritium dial. So it has no luminescence. When you put this in the dark, you're going to find that it's dead, and that's the way collectors would prefer it. An honest tritium fade is always preferable to a factory replacement dial. You'll also note that there's a book printed at 3 o'clock. Omega, Seamaster, Professional, Chronometer, 300 meter, 1,000 feet. Of course, if you do the quick mental math, you realize 300 meters is not 1,000 feet, but Swiss watch conventions. And then you've got the aperture for the date at 3 o'clock. So what's inside? A 25 joule automatic winding, COSC chronometer certified, Omega Caliber 1164. 44 hour power reserve, unidirectional winding action, quick set date, hacking or stop seconds, chronograph functionality via a cam system and a lateral clutch. It's based on the Valju 7750, but in its highest spec of technical equipment, so hairspring, drivetrain, balance, regulator, and the highest finishing spec executed custom for Omega. If you were to open it up, it would say Omega and have special decoration on it. It is not a generic value piece. A handsome watch with screw-down crown but simulated screw-down pushers. These are not actually shouldered screw-down pushers. Anytime you want, you can actuate the chronograph without threading out the shoulders of the chronograph pusher. Now, this is good because it means your chronograph is always accessible and you get 300 meter water resistance without the hassle of a screw down. You just need to remember though, you can actuate it at any time still. Really, seriously, don't try to function cycle underneath the water or when the watch is wet. It's still not a submersible chronograph action. It's a submersible watch. You can see and you can purchase this quintessential Bond villain timepiece and an emerging vintage timepiece, now over 20 years old, on our website, thewatchbox.com.